Disclaimer. The views discussed are the speakers. Every attempt is made to ensure information is factual and relevant. If anything seems incorrect, please contact us with reason why this might be the case and we will look into it. And finally, and really importantly, the intention is to have a positive effect on society. We're providing these videos free of charge. We have limited resources and doing the best we can. In essence, this is Don't Judge a Book by its cover. We don't have the resources to make fancy videos and logos and shiny stuff, but really the contents of the book is key. And that's why we're putting all of our attention on the substance, not so much the style. So please bear that in mind when watching these videos and all the things on the website. One real key point which will enable you to learn this information quicker and better is really about time on the mat. We get good by doing. Watching the videos within the Reaching People course would be like reading a book on driving. You would suddenly know how to do it, but you really need to practice in order to get good. And that's why we're providing exercises that you can have an environment which is comfortable where you can actually practice and get good. Many of the concepts straight away will enable you to adjust the way you approach things and that would be good. But bear in mind, it will take time. So don't be too hard on yourself. Be very open-minded and, and enjoy the learning. It's been a, a growth for me and for those that have looked at this up to now. Thank you. Enjoy the video. Okay, so how to ethically influence. So this is really a, today is going to be an overview of reaching people. So some presentation notes, right? First of all, I think this is really key that we acknowledge ourselves. The fact that we're still functioning in all this craziness in itself is, is, a, is a plus. We've put, put under a huge amount of stress for the last two years, probably more than anyone's experienced. Um, and I think the fact that we're still functioning is really testament to the strength of our humanity. Uh, we've got limited resources on this project, so we really aim for substance over style. It's really about getting you the information. We try and present it in a, the most absorbable way and the most sort of graphical way, but obviously we only have limited time to do that. Uh, there's a very good analogy, which is the apple juice. And what we mean by this is if you go to the store and you buy an apple juice, one of the cloudy ones, when we're learning, the, the bottle gets shaken up. And as we're learning, everything seems a bit cloudy and a bit confusing. But at once we relax and we absorb, then everything starts to make sense and it becomes clear. Now, it's certainly been my experience in learning this information that it takes me sometimes two or three times in watching a video before I get it. So sort of sit back, relax. This is being recorded. You can rewatch it a few times and you'll see that the concepts will start to make sense a lot more the second or third time because some of these concepts may be the first time that you hear about them. Now here's a caveat. I'm going to try and explain some very advanced behavioral concepts in simple terms. In order to do so, it's going to lose some accuracy. You can't not do that, but I don't think the accuracy that we lose will be a problem because we really, for our purpose and what we need this for, is just a general concept. So there's going to be lots of questions and you can ask those at the end. And one point is that I've spent so much time over the last year in cognitive dissonance. I mean, it's incredible because once I learn information, I realize it, I didn't think that was true and then I have to incorporate it. So that's where this apple juice sometimes becomes a bit uncomfortable and that's okay. So just, yeah. but what's important is that nearly all of these concepts should be self-evidently true. And if they're not, you can ask questions, but there come a point where they're, they're all testable. You'll look and you'll see, ah, I can see why that is the case now. So today's agenda, we're going to have a look at history of the project, we're going to look at the goal of the project, and then we're going to look at what are the three steps to reaching someone. And then we're going to have Q&A. And there's optional exercises, but obviously time permitting. So what is the project about? Well, it's for people wishing to challenge an idea or belief or a whole narrative with someone who isn't, or even worse still, resisting it being challenged. So a classic example, we have Jane Bloggs, and she wishes to talk to her Joe Bloggs brother, uh, open conversation, but he's very resistant. So the project is about acquiring the skills, the knowledge, and the right mindset in order to have those conversations. Each person has more than enough resources to understand each element. So you have more than you need. 
it's just it requires a bit of perseverance and and practice in order to get good at really reaching someone that's highly conditioned it's not new funny enough this is historically a challenging endeavor and it was actually max planck a famous quantum physicist who says science moves on one funeral at a time he was referring to the fact of is when you try and challenge an established idea, it will always meet resistance. And this really is by the nature of the way the brain is structured and the way it works. So Jane has ideas and beliefs, as does Joe. And then when they differ, that is when the challenge begins. So what is reaching people like? It's like the game, the steady hand. I don't know if anyone remembers this, but you've literally got to uh, get this thing through this without setting the buzzer off. But here's the interesting thing. If you don't know anything about the, the psychology that's being used against us or behavioral sciences, the game that we're playing, we're blindfolded. And this is why so many people aren't aware. Why is someone reacting that way? Why have they suddenly exploded? Because I said one word. And it's only when you take the blindfold off, you begin to see the game for what it is, that it will make sense. And some people are a lot harder to reach than others. And we will explain that why. So this, this really, this project is about having a real steady hand, understanding what you need to do and seeing what you need to do. So here's a very interesting question, which we kind of addressed in the, in the questions, which is why are facts, logic or reason not working? And it's actually quite a simple reason is because the facts, the logic and the reason that we're supplying differs from the one that the person assumes. And when that happens, if a fact contradicts a belief, it will be rejected. OK, and this there are exceptions to this. And the exceptions is often when the authority principle overrides. So someone a lot of the time will assume an authority's belief if they if it differs from their own. And this is a lot of the reason why the fact checkers give people a simple route out of discomfort. So a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of willful ignorance going on and there's a lot of people putting their head in the sands and the fact checkers allows that path of least resistance. So effectively, on the spectrum, if we were to give it a visual representation, you'll see like A to Z. Let's say that Jane's over at Z and, and uh, Z and, and Joe's at A. Any fact that Jane presents to Joe is effectively around the narrative going to be rejected because it contradicts his view. And this really is like in magnets. So when you present in a fact that differs from someone else's fact, it's just going to repel away. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why this happened. And in fact, it's really a part of evolution as a protection mechanism. So if you imagine that you've been told stories by your parents, uh, you know, it's go, say it's going back a few thousand years and they say to you, don't stroke tigers. That's a protection mechanism. If someone comes along and says to you, oh, it's actually okay to stroke tigers, you're gonna resist that because your belief system is there to protect you. Okay, so the history of the project and my background. So effectively, the history of my background started in Feb 96 and I started uh, my own consultancy up and I was consulting to multinationals and individuals uh, since that time. In September 96, I was uh, made a CIO of a company and then I suddenly realized I was completely out of my depth and I started studying uh, psychology intensely, NLP, EFT, many other techniques. And because I was in charge of the training budget, it was quite straightforward to do so. Um, and that got me on the path of really asking about human behavior. Um, since that time, I've uh, spent many contracts all around the world, consulting to some major companies. Um, about five years ago, I got to the point where I couldn't do it anymore because some of the roles, I mean, to give you an example, is like moving hundreds of millions of pounds offshore, which is obviously not helping the economy of that country. So I turned my back on it and, and just decided to live a much simpler life. Um, so I've had a real extensive study of influence factors, general somatics, uh, cognitive biases, reasoning, systems theory. It's just been a real sort of nerdy passion of mine. And then March 2020, um, I found myself completely bewildered. Uh, I thought I had a really good understanding of psychology. And then when I would have conversations with people, uh, I suddenly realized my listening skills weren't what I thought they were. And I suddenly realized that something was very amiss. Uh, at that particular point, up until Jan 2020, uh, sorry, actually, um, yeah, let's just say Jan 20, anyway, so nine months, 
uh, actually, anyway, I've got the dates and it was, whenever the thing kicked off in March, 2020, then I spent nine months. Oh yeah, so Jan 21, that should reach. So I spent nine months sort of researching why I was so bewildered. So I did many, many courses, read many books, spoke to lots of experts. And that's when we created the Reaching People project. Um, and it started off with four people on a Zoom. Um, and it was really assisting a couple of people how to talk to their parents. Um, because as most people have realized, the, their parents were fully uh, bought into the, uh, the narrative. So then we created the project. And uh, since that time, we're now on this particular project. There's 400 of us at the moment. And it's actually pushing on 500 this week. And what we're doing now is we donate a, a time to many of the well-known groups, um, you know, Heart Panda and many of the other ones, uh, talk to many psychologists, behavioral experts around the world. And where we find ourselves at now is that we, we have an awful amount of content and knowledge, and it's really at the point now to really simplify this and get it out to all the groups uh, that are trying to fight the, the totalitarianism and really get them to be effective to reach people. So that's really where the project is headed. Um, and it's ongoing. So it's completely, you know, um, having people add to the data week by week and we're refining and we're learning new things. And as we do that, we become better. Okay, so the goal of the project. So the goal of the project and the, the initial goal, funny enough, was to convince someone of facts. Um, and then we suddenly realized that actually that goal was not the best goal to have because we found ourselves trying to sort of convince people and therefore we were starting to border on coercion, etc. And we realized that actually wasn't a good goal because we trip over ourselves. So the new goal is to, to have open and honest conversations where the truth will arise. So it's to create the conditions for open and honest conversations is the goal of the project. That allows us to, to be very non-specific in which side of the agenda on. I've already stated very clearly that I'm challenging the narrative. That's where I stand in my belief systems. But you can never be a thousand percent or hundred percent that you are correct about everything. So by creating the circumstances where the truth will arise, we lose the goal of being right. And we adopt the goal of being finding the truth. And that's really key. And if we can get the person we're talking to to adopt the same goal and not be attached to being right, that's when we can get a lot of success. So the conditions for failure in a conversation are pretty straightforward. So if we have lab labels of anti and pro, the conversation is finished before it even starts because we're judgmental and we, we see things how they're not. If we're in opposition of the other, then what happens is, and I'm, you've only got to look at any political debate in the world. Has anyone ever seen a, you know, Labour versus Conservative and one of them turns around and says, actually, I was wrong, the other guy was correct. That does not happen because the nature of the debate is to win the debate, is not to find truth. So this is why these conditions are not productive for truth and correct science. Uh, not respecting the other person's view, lack of understanding of beliefs, derogatory comments, fight or flight triggered continuously, um, and divide and conquer. So that really are the conditions for a failure in a conversation. And I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that a lot of conversations are set up that way. So what do we need in contrast? We need conditions for success. So it's common ground. We, we transcend the anti and pro and we realize what is what do anti and pro want? They both want good health. Once we start to uh, agree that we're not trying to kill everyone, you know, we both actually want good health, then we will know that we're on common ground, we want the same thing. Respect and dignity, so we respect each other and knowing who the real enemy is. There are some bad people, there are some people pushing some pretty dodgy agendas and, and what they have is they have the people fighting against each other. So we need to transcend this. You're still going to meet a lot of people, you know, that are somewhere on the spectrum of willful ignorance, uh, et cetera. But we've got to give people the benefit of the doubt and assume that they have good intentions, or certainly the ones that we know are. And a lot of these people are, you know, family members and cousins, et cetera. So, and then we want to share information effectively. 
Okay, and I know it's very wordy at the moment, but it will get very graphical and metaphorical shortly. And this really is setting the tone for what we want to do and really knowing the pitfalls, knowing what the things that I will say that will get a bad response and not allow me to reach someone. And then managing our state effectively. This is a really important skill and it's not one you know, that is easy to do because people are forever trying to push our buttons. And of course, we're humanity focused. Yeah, so it's not profit focused or being right focused, but we're focused on humanity as a whole. Okay, so hopefully that starts to let us understand why we've chose to have that as the goal and how that really becomes sort of um, inclusive. I think that's really key. And of course, anyone that doesn't want the truth of, to arise will not like that goal and they will you know, show themselves for being not having good intentions. So the three steps. Okay, and it's very important to get these steps all, all correct because if one of these fails miserably, it tends that all the conversation will go badly. So the first thing is our approach. Okay, it's really key how we approach a conversation. Then we've got the conditions of the conversation, which is really creating the right conditions where we can have an open, honest conversation. And then the form of sharing. How do we share the information is really critical. Now, if we get all of these aligned and correct, then the information that we wish to share will usually be nice and we will make an impact. We will sow some seeds at least. We will get some points across to people and that's really key. It's, un, uh, it's unwise to expect you to say one thing to someone and then suddenly go, oh, I'm gonna completely change my whole belief systems. That's not really how it works. It, it's really, a, it tends to take time. And I've had people, you know, I had one particular example where I had someone that was completely bought into the narrative, hook, line and sinker. I didn't see him for two months. And then he come up to me and he said, oh, you, you were right. The whole thing is a complete farce. And I, I said, oh, hang on a minute, what did it for you? And it, we couldn't really identify any one thing. It was an accumulation of things. And it's really the straw that broke the camel's back. But the way to look at it is if you've seen the selective attention test, there's, which is very powerful, most people have, they ask you to count the amount of times a person bounces a basketball, but they do it on purpose because in fact, during that, a gorilla walks past the screen. Now, most people, like half, half the people watching it, don't see the gorilla initially because they're focused on the bouncing of the ball. But here's the thing, once you see the gorilla, you can't unsee the gorilla. And that's the thing, when we learn to share information very effectively and we break through all the barriers, people won't be able to unsee what they see. <clears throat> so the three steps, if they're not aligned, then we won't have a successful conversation. And I'm just gonna show a few of the things that will cause them not to be aligned. And we go into these in detail in many of the other videos. So today is really the overview of this, to really grasp at a, at a high level, at a framework, why we've chosen to, to work the way we do. So now our ball cannot reach our goal. Our information cannot reach its home because we're not aligned. So if we're evangelical in our approach, this will trigger reactants. This is the term in people to resist information. Uh, we've all had that experience of being in a shop. We want the product that's there, but the salesman is too pushy. What do we do? We leave, we go somewhere else, right? Because they're just too pushy. And, and it's, I think we've all done this. We've all, I know on myself has been, oh, you've got to watch this, you've got to, do, and I'm sending people at the start hundreds of videos, right? I think we all acknowledge now that wasn't very successful and because it's just too overwhelming for the person. Perceived threat. If we ever trigger the fight or flight, the person will go into the emotional part of their brain and shut down. Now, with so much propaganda aimed at divide and conquer now, you've only got to mention that you're not in complete support of one of the policies and suddenly you're a threat to them. This is one of the biggest things we have to overcome. So it's very key that when we engage is to not to trigger this. And, and obviously smiling at someone is one of the most important things. And obviously that's not so easy with many of the people wearing masks. Our belief systems will really get in the way. If we believe people can't be reached, we have no chance of reaching them. I was fortunate enough to work on a project with Bruce Lipton, who wrote The Biology of Belief. And he said to me, you know, at dinner one night, he said, if you want to know what your belief systems are, just look around. 
just look around at your life. What's interesting about the belief systems, it's a, where did we get our belief systems? From the very authorities that we're trying to challenge, okay? And it's in their interest to teach us not to challenge authority. You see the irony, the circular reference? We are conditioned from literally, you know, play school, not to challenge authority, okay? And it's actually key that we do so. I was fortunate myself is that the school I was at, they told us 1984 Animal Farm, et cetera. And then we had Q&A to actually explore these concepts. That seems to be missing from the education system at the moment from what I can tell. And of course, how we perceive them as it were is very, very key. I used to get absolutely angry at anyone wearing a mask. And what I found was that they wouldn't go anywhere near me. Once I resolved these emotions and I became very much inclusive, I don't support masks, I don't like them in any way, but I now see the people as having false information. It was quite astonishing, the change that happened is that people were so much more friendly to me. It was really incredible. That's now gonna be ramped up more and more now as they polarize people, so this is gonna get even more difficult. Okay, the conditions. Studies show if two people are having a conversation and they see themselves as members of different groups, they will dismiss everything that the other person says. This is the whole point of anti-vax and pro-vax. If two people consider themselves, you know, one's pro and one is anti and they have a debate, they are going to resist all information that the other person proposes. This is why we have to break these labels. We have to transcend them. We have to find a way to say, okay, so what is it you want? And we've got many examples on how to do that. We obviously need to set the conditions where we're respectful to each other and we're committed to the truth. If we're committed to winning, we're going to trip over ourselves. But the fact that we, as a sort of a movement, if you say, feel that we are committed to truth, this should be relatively simple. If we can get them committed to truth as well, then we're going to be able to transcend that divide and conquer. When it comes to sharing, most people sharing of information, as we've looked at, just triggers dissonance. Um, it was Jerome Bruner, that, who was a cognitive psychologist in the 60s, that he showed if you just told someone a fact in one instance and you told them a fact wrapped in a story, the fact wrapped in a story would land 22 times more effectively. How often do we just give people raw facts? People aren't able to digest it. They're not able to make sense of it. And that's why stories, metaphors and questions are our preferred method of sharing information. Um, and of course, too many people push against inertia. And what we mean by this is, let's say that you have a belief system that you want to challenge the safety of the COVID vaccines. That is gonna be much more simple than challenging vaccines in general. So we have to be, you know, don't push against trees. You know, we start with the easy part first and we will work our ways up. So some inertia, so what happens with a narrative is that inertias will change. So initially, you couldn't question the origin of, of COVID. It was like, it's a natural virus and that's it. And if you say anything else, you're a conspiracy theorist. It suddenly changed. It suddenly changed where you could question the origin and now people can question whether it's manufactured or not. This is being very aware of inertia and narratives and don't push against inertias or it's a lot less successful to push against stronger inertias than weaker ones. And obviously perceived effort. So people will really only do things a lot of the time if it's, you know, the simplest path. So buy it. And we, we created a website called thescriptbook.co.uk. And our intention there was to take lots of scientific data from many of the great groups that are producing it and simplify it so much that it was very simple for someone to digest. So that would be the first place we'd recommend sending them because most people don't know how to read a published medical study because it's not been in their education. Okay, so they're the three things. How the, creating the right approach, creating the right conditions, and then sharing the information in a correct way. So our approach effectively, and what this slide is gonna show us, that if we imagine a metaphor, and it's a very powerful metaphor, and, and many uh, experts in psychology will use this, is that the conscious mind is the rider of a horse. The unconscious mind is the horse. Who decides where you go, okay? Most of us are under the illusion that it's us, the rider. But the truth is, if the horse doesn't feel safe going to where we want it to go, it will not go. 
And this is why if we have a goal, but we have obstacles and resistance in the way, a lot of the time we will just procrastinate and we a lot of people will reach out for food and TV. And, and that's, that's not to be judgmental. That's how we operate. So really it's to understand what are the obstacles and the resistance. So most of the time in human nature, and you'll see it in people's behaviors at the moment, is we usually double down and we try to produce more force. Yeah, when in fact we should just work on the obstacles. So the fact that most of the policies didn't work that they've used at the moment, oh, we need to do stronger policies. Well, no, we need to change the policies or find out why they're not working. So effectively, we move away from pain and we move towards pleasure. Now, what's happened is, is that behavioral insights and the psychologists, they understand this at a real deep level. So they're manipulating our environment and our understanding of things in order for the horse to move away from the virus and move towards what they propose and then move away from alternate treatments. Okay, now it's a very powerful metaphor when you really understand it, but if I give you an example, it really will make start to make sense. So when I was working a lot with phobias and in general working with athletes, what I noticed was that no one ever came to see me with a phobia unless they were placed in a situation where they had to deal with it. For example, I had an actor when I was working in Sydney, an actor came to see me because he had a phobia flying. He had just won a part in a Hollywood movie, so he had to fly to LA. He didn't want to solve his phobia because consciously we think that thing's dangerous. So to lose the safety catch isn't something we want to do. I was talking to one of the doctors at the march and he and I was talking about phobias and he said that he most of his family had a spider phobia. And I said, but you consciously know that spiders aren't dangerous. And he goes, yes. I said, that doesn't change your fear, does it? He goes, oh, yeah. His son was the only member of his family that wasn't scared. And then I asked his son, why are you not scared? He said, oh, when I was at school, I picked one up to impress a girl. So he's trained his horse, his unconscious mind, that spiders aren't dangerous. So effectively understanding this, you'll realize that a lot of people are having their horse conditioned and programmed to move away from some things and towards others. And consciously knowing that won't always be enough. It's when that information drops to the unconscious mind that it's key. And that's the power of stories and metaphors. Now, the next slide is, is a very key slide. Now, it's, it's not going to be easy to get it the first time, but persevere. And once you see it, because it's a very, very powerful slide. So to describe what's going on is that this person here would be us challenging the narrative. This person here is the representation of someone's conscious mind. OK, now, what happens is that our conscious mind is, is a bit like uh, an, well, our minds are a bit like an iceberg. The things that you can see, the behavior and the conscious mind are on top, but the things that are driving it are under the surface. So effectively, behavior at the bottom level is that when you're talking to someone or interacting with someone, behavior is the only thing you'll see. So this really is the office of behavior, and it's a metaphor to describe what are the key things that drive people's behavior? So in fact, our behavior is driven by our knowledge, our skills, and our habits. Okay, that's what drives our behavior. But our knowledge, our skills, and our habits are actually driven by our beliefs and our values. Then the, the question is, what are our beliefs and our values driven by? They're driven by our personal identity and our self-image. It doesn't matter what you try to do. If you have a self-image, you can't do something, you'll be ever fighting against yourself. So here's where it gets interesting. The personal identity and our self-image is can be superseded by a group identity. And this is sometimes when someone may adopt a new religion or become a member of a group or, or even a cult. What will happen is that they will adopt the beliefs and values of that group. Now, becoming members of a group is a natural human thing, but we should have a healthy relationship with the groups that we're a member of. When the groups start to impose themselves on us and we start to align our beliefs to the groups, that's when things become problematic. And obviously that's something that we're seeing a lot of in the world. So the question is that really, and in a minute I'll give you a few examples of why this is so important to understand, 
But to, the metaphor really is that our behavior is a bit like if you went into a shop, it's the staff members, it's the ones you would interact with. They're really driven by the HR and the training. You don't see that as behind the scenes. And the HR and the training is driven by the management. And the management is driven by the CEO. So the CEO, if the CEO decides something and he tells all the staff to do something, then everyone underneath does it. Or, you know, it's my way or the highway most of the time. And what's going on at the moment is the CEO of companies are actually having to answer to governing bodies. So those billionaires, etc. if they want to influence a system, they know that they influence the governing body and then that's all they need to do. Everything else takes care of itself. When they're influencing us, if they can influence the groups that we're a member of or our personal identities, then all of the things down here will change much easier. For instance, the reason that a lot of the, the, the certain policies have been infiltrating lots of religions and groups to get them to represent the policy is why the governing bodies have started to, to, to really put that pressure because then people do not want to be excluded from their groups. One of the primal fears is, is being excluded from a group. So in fact, the groups are saying, well, we need you to do this. And of course, we know that there's a thousand and one coercions to stay a part of that group. In fact, there's a lot of pressure on now that you'll be excluded from society unless you do what that group says. Obviously, that's not a healthy relationship with that group. Now, there's so many ways that this metaphor becomes very powerful because it allows us to explain a lot of what's going on. So for instance, if you mandate, so if you bring in a law that someone has to wear a mask, that's a behavior. If the person says, well, what is you know, putting a mask on my face gonna protect me from a virus? So their belief system will differ from the behavior. Most people and 80% of people do not have enough personal self-image to push back against authority. So they cave in and they just wear the mask just to, you know, just to follow rules. Then what happens is they will experience cognitive dissonance. So they'll experience a, a difference between their belief and their behavior. People don't, you, you can't hold dissonance for long. So what happens is that unconsciously they will change their belief and start to support it because they don't want to look stupid. And the, you know, the ego is always trying to align itself. So what you'll find is that constantly the policies that are introduced bit by bit on purpose are to trigger an internal cognitive dissonance so the person will change their belief systems to match their behavior. And it's one of the rare times that changing a behavior alone will change belief systems and personal identity. That makes sense. So from the Mindspace document, what the UK government is doing is looking to change people's self-image. Now, there are positive ways to do this. But to quote one of the, uh, the one of the influence ways within the Mindspace document, which is a UK government document, you know, showing how to influence people, is that there's a thing known as the commitment principle. And what it shows is that if you can get someone to do a behavior, a very small behavior that's not bad, they will often change their self-image to support the behavior which it supports. To give you an example, they went to a, a, a group of uh, residents in California in the 70s and they said, we want you to put this big sign in your garden that says, please drive carefully. Um, there was only a 17% compliance. So only 17% of people said yes. They then went to a different set of residents and they said to them, can you please sign this petition, which was a petition to drive carefully. They went back to those residents two weeks later and said, can we put this sign in your garden? The compliance went from 17 to 76%, which in terms of compliance is extraordinary. And what happens was, is by getting them to do that small behavior, the person has changed their self-image around that particular subject. We have seen that constantly over the two years. The clapping to the sky on a Thursday night for in the UK, for those not in the UK, um, they had a thing in the UK where they clapped to support the NHS, just a very token gesture. 
what happened was that the people doing it would then obviously change their self-image to be very supportive of the NHS. Those that didn't clap were then suddenly seen as the outsiders and pushing against it. Oh, why aren't you supporting them? It's only a clap. And this is it's only a clap. It's only a mask. It's only this is the slippery slope to compliance via the commitment principle. OK, so there's one uh, there's now we're going to look at something that's really key when we're having conversations and we're just going to introduce two what appear co complex terms that are actually relatively straightforward this is a seesaw we've got two parts of our brain represented here one of them is the pfc that's known as the prefrontal cortex that's the rational part of the brain you've got one called the amygdala that's the emotional part of the brain these are related inversely which means whichever one is down the other one will be up and vice versa so if you are triggered into the emotional state of mind you cannot be rational yeah because the rational mind actually shuts down to protect us the blood rushes to your heart your limbs it shuts down your digestion etc this is why stress is very hard on the digestive system so this is very key because in fact, a lot of conversations, this is getting triggered. What will happen is, is that in a conversation of two people, if one person gets triggered, there's a very good chance the other person will get triggered because of mirror neurons in the brain. If someone's being aggressive to you, chances are we're aggressive back. Now, this is one of the hardest things to train. And even, you know, I got triggered the other day in MS where someone was very, very rude to me and I, I got quite agitated. But it's important to train it that you become less so. So in fact, it happens to me, you know, 5% of what it used to happen and it's a constant training. But what some key points is that fear, stress and strong emotions will weaken the PFC. So in fact, when we're under a lot of stress, this is why in fact, fear was one of the main currencies used. And obviously Laura Dodsworth wrote that incredible book on fear, I think it was called The State of Fear is that when people are triggered into the amygdala, they become much more vulnerable to influence. The insular cortex is one other complex thing just to mention, but this actually is the part of the brain which is responsible for, if you took a bite into some fruit or food that was moldy and off, you would get this reflex to like, oh, it's horrible, it's terrible. That's the part of the brain of the, the gag reflex. It's actually the part of the brain that represents disgust. Now, what's interesting is as we developed moles, you know, 30, 40,000 years ago, the brain didn't involve a new part of the brain. So it actually uses the insular cortex to code morality. This is why when you see someone is immoral, you feel disgusted at them and sometimes you feel it viscerally. This is why they've gone to extreme lengths to code anyone in the minority or unvaccinated, etc., as immoral, because then people start treating them with a lot of anger. The insular cortex talks to the amygdala, and the amygdala is the seed of violence. And if this continues to go on, people will start supporting violence against the unvaccinated. And this is why this divide and conquer is designed this way, because it's very easy to get a unity, and then you start getting this mass formation. So extreme fear will make people very vulnerable to influence. Now, as you would have seen from the video, um, if those of you watched it, of the lady in the park, um, Rachel managed to transcend that. And then they had a very nice conversation. So in fact, the labels in the mind that were triggering these things changed. And you can do this really quickly when you understand how it's working. And in fact, one of the key things is just to be nice to people when they're being nasty to us, which is, you know, takes the patience of a saint. But when you can do so, they can't continue to be nasty. And, and this is actually a key point that carbon dioxide triggers the amygdala. So the fact that people are wearing masks is going to make them by nature much quicker to jump into this uh, irrational part of the brain, which is the fight or flight. It, it really surprised me at first why people were so emotional so quickly when you just mention a trigger word. And this is why, because the ego is feeling threatened and the organism, the person, the human is feeling threatened. And of course, that's why... The, the narrative is so pervasive and so strong because in fact our primal thing is safety it always is so once they trigger that safety then you know people become very prone to influence by the same token if you stay in the rational part of the mind the fight or flight is off uh, it becomes very powerful so some key points are that the one of the, the quickest ways to strengthen up the, the prefrontal cortex is meditation 
and many other sort of TLC, you know, tender love and care processes. So, you know, yoga, Qigong, breathing, you know, watching comedy, all these things will really help you to be able to stay rational longer. EFT, which is, we provide calls on a Tuesday night for this emotional freedom technique can significantly dampen the amygdala response. So in fact, you can actually remove a lot of the triggers that will trigger you into emotional. A lot of people think they can control this, you know, rationally and consciously during a conversation. And, and that's really wishful thinking from my perspective, because when I get triggered emotionally, I lose conscious control. That's just the nature of it. But if after the event, you and there are ways that you can strengthen up in the time but after the event if you then go and process why you got triggered you remove the trigger or can remove the trigger and the next time they can say the same thing and it has no effect and those of us challenging the narrative if we're able to remove or resolve our triggers then what happens is that they won't get triggered half as much either so it's very powerful that aspect and i think it's one of the most important and then, of course, this insular cortex plays a huge role in the divide and conquer because it's where they're morally coding good and bad. And each side of the narrative is seeing the other side is good or bad. So this is a slide from the video. And the person on the left is Rachel. And she managed to resist, you know, the getting into the, the fight or flight. But here's what's really fascinating. And this won't or won't apply to everyone because a lot of us would have managed to deal with a lot of these emotions coming up, but not all of them. So the lady on the right is experiencing these emotions and she's thinking that these emotions are caused by the other person. By the same token, loads of people challenging the narrative are blaming those complying. And, you know, there's a lot of truth in, in, in many of the aspects, but what it doesn't change is the fact that this is the perfect divide and conquer okay the person complying with the narrative is scared of the person not complying and the person not complying is scared of the person complying for the opposite reasons so you can see it's literally the perfect divide and conquer so when you divide and conquer you know a family or a nation or any this way the job's done the brain will do the rest because in our brain you know once you see someone as morally inferior you will justify all these emotions so of course the key in terms of the conditions which is the next step is a reorientation so in our mind to see ourselves and the public the you know our, our cousins and our friends and whatever as both being on the same side once we change that in our mind, this will change our behavior. And then it's for us to relate to them that we're on the same side. And there's many ways, and we show in many videos how to do this. But if you don't establish this, the person will ignore pretty much everything you say. Because studies show that if you don't consider yourself part of the same group and the groups are in opposition, they will just dismiss. So it's such a key point, and I think one of the most important points. So really, it's for us to come on the same side and realize it's the them, the real them, of those pushing the narrative, and then the narrative itself. So then what you'll find is that we start fighting each other, cease fire, and we start asking questions, and a lot of them. So in fact, we need to transcend the labels, because the labels and the symbols are the things that drive the unconscious responses. So then we, we must not step in the ring. Now, the funny thing is a lot of this, you know, obviously what I'm advocating is a slightly different approach, but there is the tough love does work on a lot of people. But here's the thing. There's no absence of tough love. Yeah. Those challenging the narrative, the amount of tough love people, there's thousands of them. There's loads of comedians using the comedy aspect, etc. So all of that stuff, if that will work on someone, it probably already would have worked. So this approach is really the, the bit I think that's been missing on those that need a different approach. It's not returning the dignity of violation. So if someone violates our dignity, it's this what uh, uh, Gandhi talked about an eye for an eye. You know, if it's an eye for an eye, everyone would be blind. So it's very hard not to uh, return the dignity of violation, but we don't have to. And of course, uh, you know, not stepping in the ring. So that again. Uh, and then it's really separating the person from the idea. It's the idea that's the problem, not the person. And if we can separate the person from the idea, then they won't feel attacked. Literally, if you think about the, the office of uh, behavior that we showed, 
the worst word, the, the words that you can say to someone that get the strongest emotional response is you are wrong. You are wrong is a literally an attack on someone's identity. If you said, oh, that fact doesn't seem right, that's completely different to saying they're wrong. You see the difference in that separating the person from the idea. Okay, so let's now assume that we've got our approach correct. We've managed to see, you know, what's the best way of approaching the conversation. We then got the conditions correct for the conversation. So we now have got a nice connection with the people we're talking to. Next, now is the key where we start sharing. But here's the thing. Most people, I think, jump to straight to this. And I did it completely until I realized that I had to establish the connection. And then we've got what is the most effective way of sharing information? Well, as it turns out, stories. And it was Plato that said, those who tell the stories rule society. It's no surprise that many billionaires bought all the media. The media are terrible for making money. It's just an absolute loss-making venture. But they were all purchased because they realized the power of stories. It's been known for thousands of years that stories really bypass the conscious mind and they really update our perception very well and very effectively. In fact, every culture and country on the planet has a history of story. And, and Joseph Campbell traveled the globe and wrote a book about it. In fact, we learn to tell stories kind of before we even learn to talk. We're literally trying to formulate. It's literally the way the brain is structured. And this is why when Jerome, uh, Jerome Bruner showed but a fact wrapped in a story is 22 times more effective. Then we've got metaphor. So it was actually Aristotle that said the greatest thing by far is to be a master of metaphor. It is the one thing that cannot be learned from others and it's also a sign of genius. Since a good metaphor implies an intuitive perception of the similarity of the dissimilar. Anyway, the metaphors are very powerful. Do you remember one of the metaphors of the, the narrative, the circuit breaker? People understood that so simply, and that one metaphor enabled people to buy into the lockdowns and start saying, oh, well, we need it. We need a circuit breaker. We think through metaphor. Metaphor is so powerful. I watched, I've watched numerous scientists give presentations, and I tell you, most of the only things I remember are the metaphor. I watched one fantastic presentation, which was an hour long, uh, and the, the, the doctor scientist gave an absolutely brilliant lecture. One of the scientists asked the question, he used a metaphor. When I think back, the only thing I remember about that was the metaphor, okay? Because it, it penetrates our unconscious mind. Fortunately, the, the presentation was recorded so we can consciously go through it for the data. But if you want to get an idea across to someone, uh, if you put it in a metaphor, it will land very effectively. There's a very good book on this. It's called The Lady with the Iceberg. Um, the tall lady with the iceberg and it's a brilliant book and, and she says information plus metaphor equals understanding and, and I'm very inclined to, to agree with that and then our last uh, weapon of mass communication these are three weapons of mass communication is that good questions inform but great questions transform so if you think about the the uh, office of behavior if we know which level of someone's uh, mental state we ask the question, we can develop a question that's really, really, really powerful. Uh, one of the most powerful questions we've developed actually usually gets people to disengage, but it creates cognitive dissonance within themselves. And I think it's a very powerful question. And it's this, would you still follow the policies if they cause more harm than good? And that gives the person a real challenge. They've either got to outsource to authority or they've got to take moral responsibility. So we can start to really ask some difficult questions. You can ask a very simple question. Oh, have you heard about this Mindspace document? Oh, what's that? Suddenly they're now aware that the UK government has got a department of coercing people. So you bring it into their awareness. Okay, so um, in summary, um, you've got, the you know our approach is the key thing to get right then the conditions and then what we share um and, and this is really the overview and on our uh, on the course you'll actually see these broken down with a lot more information um so everything's uh, the course is free everything's there if you benefit like to donate uh welcome to do so here for further videos and information, reachingpeople.net, info at reaching people. And I'm now going to open it up for questions.